Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Again, my name is Shreyas Sen from Purdue University and we have the fortune of welcoming Johan Franz who received his BS degree in electrical engineering from Bandung Institute of Technology Indonesia in 95 and MS degree in electrical engineering from Stanford in 2001. From 2001 to 2012, he was with Rambus where he worked on high performance and low power serial links and memory interfaces as circuit design engineer, circuit architect and design manager. Since 2012, he has been with Xilinx. He is currently leading design teams as senior engineering director in Xilinx Sardis Technology Group, developing high-speed wireline transfers for advanced FPGA. His current interests include high-speed mixed signal circuit design, serial link architecture, transmitter, receiver design, PLL, DLL, memory interfaces, and low-power circuit architectures. He is a member of ISSCC Worldline Subcommittee. Welcome, Johan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about ADC-based wireline transceiver, uh, especially for 56 gig up to 112 gig um, uh, PAM4. Uh, after some introduction, I will go over very high level architecture of the ADC-based transceiver. I'll then cover the uh, transmitter design very briefly, because the transmit transmitter is really not unique to ADC-based receiver. You can work with analog or, or um, ADC-based RX. Uh, I will spend most of my time uh, talking about the ADC-based RX design. That's front-end, ADC, clocking, and, and DSP. Um, the control loops, such as ADC calibration, CDR, and EQ adaptation will also be covered. And at the very end, um, I will see how we scale that design uh, from 56 gigabit per second to 112 gigabit per second. Uh, just bear with me, I'm setting my timer. So about five years ago, the industry was trying to define a standard for 56 gigabit per second, and eventually they selected PAM4 over NRZ. And this plot here shows why that's the case. Um, so there's a push from system companies like Cisco and Huawei to extend the existing backplane that they designed for 28 gigabit per second NRZ. They want to run it at 56 gig. Now, if you look at this plot, uh, the red shows interest and loss, and the blue plot shows the cost up. If we were to adopt a 56 gigabit NRZ, we have to operate in at this point here. The Nyquist will be 20 gigahertz. So as you can see, the interest and loss is about 60 dB, but that's not the worst story. The crosstalk is also about 60 dB. So the insertion loss to crosstalk ratio is about 0 dB. Uh, to build this kind of transceiver, we, we'll, we have to spend a tremendous amount of power. So that's why PAM4 is proposed and approved, so we can operate with a Nyquist of 14 gigahertz. At least it'll give us, give us some chance, right? The loss is only 30 dB, and the ratio between loss and, and crosstalk is um, 30 dB also, so that gives us room to, to play with. Um, so the standard also acknowledged that PAM4 is difficult, more difficult than NRZ, so they, they were mindful about that and they set the target BR to be pretty moderate, 1 e minus 4 to 1 e minus 6. And they would impose the forward error correction to bring the BR down to very low level, which is uh, uh, less than 1 e minus 12. Now, uh, the industry defined long reach PAM4. The long reach is actually defined not as a physical distance, but also, uh, as a channel loss. To, between 20 to 30 dB, that's long reach. Now, to give you a perspective, what does that give you actually in terms of physical distance? If you uh, sp uh, fast forward to 100 gig, uh, this is a backplane that is not legacy. This is a specially designed backplane for 100 gig. Even with a brand new design, um, 8 inches is what you get. That's all you get with, with 20 dB loss. So that's not very practical for most systems, right? So the takeaway here is the um, uh, long reach uh, specification does not really translate to uh, appropriate uh, physical distance. And of course, people are trying to, to find solution. Uh, so at 100 gig, people propose uh, new architecture of a backplane using sophisticated cabling system, uh, brand new and exotic materials. Uh, all that is to get the physical distance back to where they used to be. Like, about 30, 35 inches of, of uh, channel length. Um, again, all this effort still requires us to um, adopt PAM4 signaling with about 30 dB of loss. 
So the key takeaway here is uh, many, many systems will require long-reach PAM4 just to uh, buy some margin on the, in terms of physical distance. So what's hard about PAM4 compared to NRZ? I'll summarize it in this slide here. First, um, with PAM4, for every symbol, we have to send two bits, right? So uh, that means there will be four levels uh, getting transmitted, every symbol. So that's, we call it plus three, plus one, minus one, minus three. So if you look at the effective signal amplitude, that's the distance between levels. Uh, so PAM4 here, um, compared to NRG, which is from there to there, we only have about one third of the signal amplitude. Okay? So that's one difficult thing. Uh, but that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is the second bullet here. Uh, the impact of residual ISI and crosstalk is three times more compared to NRZ. So that is, um, so this picture will, uh, will, will show you why. Uh, so suppose we have a receiver, uh, a PAM4 receiver is trying to resolve this green waveform here. So if there's no ISI, uh, no residual ISI, no crosstalk, the signal amplitude, let's call it H0 here, right? Now, suppose you design a system that has 10% reflection at TAP5. That means if you send a bit now, a 5 UI later, there will be 10% of reflection will come back there. Um, now, if you had designed such system and the data pattern is such that you know, 5 uh, symbol before the current symbol, there's a major pulse transition like this. So this has an amplitude of 3 times 8 zero, right? So the reflected signal from this is 10% times 3 times 80. That's 30% 80. Basically, you lose 30% of your signal just from 10% reflection. And that, that's a difficulty of handling PAM4. In NRZ, you have 10% reflection, you lose 10% of the signal. Right? With PAM4, it's triple. Now, um, the takeaway here is um, you really don't, we can't afford any residual significant residual ISI or crosstalk in, in PAM4 signaling. Um, so that's why with PAM4-based um, uh, architecture, we always see people using a large number of uh, FFE and, and DFE uh, taps to minimize residual ISI. Uh, now, if we were to use analog solution to solve this problem, this, this picture showed what it might look like in, in, in analog world, right? So you would have uh, multiple stages of linear equalization, you have multiple stages of FFE using a, a sample and hold uh, to cancel precursor ISI, and you would have many, many DFE taps to cancel your postcursor. Now what's hard about building this? The first is the DFE. Uh, as you know, DFE has a critical timing path that you have to meet. So basically you resolve a symbol and then you have to quickly go back to impact the next symbol. Um, to meet DFE timing, uh, the slicer has to be fast because the slicer delay impacts DFE timing. Now, as you all know, the slicer delay depends very much on the uh, magnitude of its input. Now, that, what that means is you have to have a very large amplitude here to close DFE timing. And in PAM4, that amplitude has to be multiplied by a factor of three. So we need very large amplitude here. That's problem number one. Uh, second problem is you see how many stages of analog circuits in here, right? So we have multiple states of CTLE, three stages of FFE, two summer. So you can easily add up to like six, uh, maybe it's like seven to eight number of uh, stages. And each one of these stages have to have very high bandwidth. Uh, it has to have a decent gain. And for PAM4, it has to meet linearity specification. So that is not easy. Now, if you look at this uh, figure, we already have to build um, high-speed track and hold. Uh, we need a large number of slicer banks. So the thought back then was, OK, we have all these components that really uh, are subcomponents of ADC. Why don't we just build ADC instead of uh, trying to solve the problem this way? So that's, why the mo that's, that's what the motivated us to build ADC-based transceiver. Um, and again, going back to this, at, at that time we decided, deciding between 56 and 100, um, sorry, the time we deciding between analog and, and ADC base, right, the spec was at 56 gigabit per second, but we also knew that 100 gig was coming. So we knew this architecture, even though we maybe could have solved it using an analog, using analog architecture, the scaling to 100 gig would be problematic. So for that reason, we opted to, uh, design ADC-based uh, long-reach uh, PAM4. Now, the advantage of ADC-based PAM4, of course, all the, well, not all, but a good portion of the equalization is done in digital domain. So in digital domain, there's no such thing as linearity problem, right? Everything is ideal, uh, close to ideal. 
So no linearity issues, robust over PBT, and uh, this is important implementation-wise, the DSP can be built using pure digital flow, uh, synthesis and place and route. Um, also, there's a promise of CMOS process scaling that would enable a lower power ADC uh, and, and DSP. Um, so this chart here shows a uh, recent trend of all 56 gig uh, ADC-based PAM4 transceiver um, that was published over the past uh, several years. Um, the, the story here is like um, the promise of process scaling is actually there. It's, it's proven that uh, the design that at uh, 7 nanometer here um, in general consumes uh, much better uh, power efficiency-wise and also it can support longer uh, channel length. So th this is uh, just a trend chart. Uh, the, there's really not much detail here that can show that um, the uh, scaling of CMOS process does help the ADC-based transceiver um, in terms of power and reach. Okay, now uh, let's switch gear to high-level ADC-based architecture. Now, in ADC-based transceiver, um, the equalization is not done purely in digital domain. Right? Uh, typically, it's split into three parts. Uh, one. Uh, one part is transmitter uh, FFE, uh, the second part is receiver front end, and the third part is your DSP. TX FFE helps reduce the signal swing, so that relaxes the linearity requirement of the receiver front end. Uh, receiver front end further equalizes the signal, uh, so that helps uh, reduces the requirement of the ADC and DSP. So we always see this combination of TX FFE, RX EQ, and, and DSP. Uh, one um, metric that's useful to indicate whether the signal is well equalized or not is a uh, peak to main ratio or, or PMR. So PMR is defined as, you know, imagine you have a pulse response that looks like this, all right, and this is your main cursor, that's, that's your signal basically. The rest are dis uh, cursors that happen because of dispersion. Those are the cursors that you don't want that the channel give you. Now, the absolute sum of these cursors uh, divided by uh, the peak uh, cursor is, is what the definition of uh, PMR is. So in this uh, diagram, uh, the black curve is unequalized uh, signal, right? So the PMR is larger, about four. And when you equalize it, the PMR goes down. So the red curve here has a PMR of two. Now, uh, the PMR is directly related to how difficult or how tight of an ADC spec we have to support. Uh, in time domain, the waveform looks like this. So the black waveform is the unequalized signal with a PMR of 4, and the red signal here is the more equalized waveform, the PMR of 2. As you can see, we want to design the ADC. So, by the way, these two signals carries, uh, these two waveforms carries the same signal. Okay. The signal is the same, it's just the noise is bigger on, on the black one. Um, so if we were to use um, ADC-based uh, method to equalize this further, for to, e to even receive the black uh, waveform here, we'll have to have ADC with this much range, right? Um, and if we were to precondition the signal the, with the red uh, plot here, uh, we roughly only need half of the ADC condensation. So basically a 6 dB improvement in PMR would save you one bit of ADC, which is a big deal in terms of uh, power and area. Now, the question remains, uh, how good of an ADC should I build to be able to use it in my high-speed link? So that is actually a simple question which is very, very difficult uh, to answer. Um, so if you talk to ADC designer, their key metric is, is ENOP, effective number of bits, which, is, which has one-to-one -one relationship with SNDR. So this ENOP here, uh, because based on SNDR, it actually summarizes, summarizes all the ADC impairments into one noise term. And that noise term is assumed to have unbounded Gaussian distribution. Uh, but in reality, many, many ADC impa impairments and not all of them has uh, Gaussian distribution. As an example, let's take quantization noise here. Uh, this is a plot of an ADC. The input is on the x-axis, output is the y-axis. Blue is ideal, and red is the actual ADC uh, quantization. If you plot uh, quantization error versus input, what you have is this uh, staircase uh, profile here. And if you take the uh, probability density function of this, the PDF will look 
closer to a bounded uniform distribution. It's certainly not unbounded Gaussian, right? So treating ADC as an ideal quantizer plus uh, uh, noise term, which is which has unbounded Gaussian distribution, would be inaccurate and not sufficient for uh, uh, bit error rate modeling. So okay, so enough is not sufficient. So how do we specify the ADC then? Um, Unfortunately, it takes more work. So for a given ADC design, we have to identify each impairment that's relevant to high-speed link. i name a few here. Nonlinearity, bandwidth, noise, sampling jitter, metastability. We have to quantify all that and uh, plot each component into a system-level model. I think Ganesh touched on this before, the importance of system-level model. So only you, once you have system-level model, only that you can tell whether this ADC is good enough or not. Okay, and there are two kinds of system level model that, that's, that's popular. One is a statistical framework. The other one is more like time domain uh, simulation. Uh, this is an example of statistical framework for ADC based link. So the ADC impairment, like ADC noise, nonlinearity, DNL, ideal quantization, um, you can calculate the uh, PDF for each of these noise terms. And then you calculate it again, uh, the PDF of these terms after equalization, and you calculate the PDF of the residual ISI, and then you convolve all that to obtain a single uh, error PDF. And then you combine that with the um, distribution of the sampling phase, and then all you, what you get is this uh, bit error rate contour. So this, uh, if you're interested in pursuing this or knowing more about this, there are two very good references. One is the published by uh, Professor Palermo's uh, group in, in A&M. The other one is from Boris Merman's group at Stanford. There's a, a good PhD thesis that, that just been published uh, last year that covers all this. Now, this statistical framework is very fast, right? Once you identify the PGF, you can estimate the link BR very, very quickly. Um, but that's not what the industry is um, treating as a de facto standard. Uh, so if you try to sell transceiver to system companies like Cisco or Huawei, what they demand is a time domain model, not, not statistical model. Um, so this one was already discussed by, by Ganesh uh, uh, earlier this morning. Um, so as a standard industry practice, we need to provide them with the time domain IPS AMI model. Um, the reason is uh, twofold. One is uh, it allows us to include logic blocks like CDR and adaptation. So if you see any convergence issue in your CDR adaptation logic, time domain model can capture that and statistical model uh, couldn't. Also, nonlinearity can be easily more easily modeled in, in time in the time domain. You can model nonlinearity in using statistical approach, but it gets uh, pretty involved and, and sometimes not accurate. Um, now, the tool that we use to do this is a signal flow based tool like ADS. Right? So we simulate it in there. And the tool's been improving over time. So we can simulate 1 million bits of full adaptation in CDR in less than 30 minutes. Uh, one drawback about this approach, though, if you're really targeting a BR of 10 to minus 12, you still can't do it. You, you still can't run uh, uh, 3 million bits, right? So you still need to extrapolate the BR from minus 6 to minus 12, which could be a source of inaccuracy. Okay, so this is an example of uh, plugging in ADC impairments uh, to build a time domain model. So the ADC thermal noise, you can model it as a time sequence uh, that has uh, AWGN distribution. Uh, DNL, residual offset and gain, you can model as bound bounded voltage noise. Nonlinearity, you just model it as is. Right? The bandwidth of the ADC, you can model it as pulse response, and then you put an ideal uh, sample and hope there, an ideal quantizer. And the random jitter for, for the ADC sampling clocks, you would plug it in as random jitter and the residual skew as STJ. So this is one practical approach to use uh, um, ADC in, for time domain simulation. All these uh, circuit non-idealities or impairments will be uh, obtained during circuit simulations. Now, armed with all this system model, right, once we have the system um, level modeling, we are ready to answer, okay, how good of an ADC should I build? Right? Okay, so I will share some of the results based on our system model uh, in the next few slides. Uh, how about, that? so for example, ADC resolution. Uh, based on system level modeling, if you target is, uh, your target is 56 gig time for long reach uh, with uh, TXFFE and CTLE, uh, six bit is sufficient. Uh, 
However, most design will do 7-bit anyway for, for margin and, and for just in case you need lower uh, BR target that's better than 1e-6. E uh, so this is the result of our simulation, the Mansard data. Um, the x-axis is the uh, sampling point and y-axis is BR. So when the sampling point is optimum, that means your residual ISI is very, very small. You can see the difference between uh, design using 6-bit ADC and 7-bit ADC, right? You can tell. So this is where residual ISI is small, so your quantization noise shows up. It becomes dominant. Um, at the edge of the eye, however, when residual noise, residual ISI is, uh, is more dominant, there's really not much difference between 6-bit and 7-bit and ADC. That means if you're, you're targeting only, you're sure you're only targeting 1E minus 6 BER, you can probably live with 6-bit. So this kind of insight is obtained by running uh, system level uh, simulation. Uh, similarly, we can determine what's, uh, what's good enough bandwidth, linearity, noise, uh, skew, and jitter. Um, so it turns out that for 3 dB bandwidth of the ADC, we, we only need it to be about Nyquist frequency. And so if we have very low ADC bandwidth, of course, it starts hurting or stressing your CTLE. And linearity and noise, if you just keep it better than CTLE, that wouldn't be a problem. And for sampling clock skew and jitter, um, just the number would be look pretty similar to the analog uh, RX, roughly 50 milliUI of deterministic jitter, and 10 milliUI of RG, RMS, that is sufficient. Okay. Again, the number here is just an example, right? To be more accurate, you need to know the target BER and you need to build your own system level model. Okay. Um, one thing that's difficult to model, uh, especially if you're using asynchronous RADC, is the metastability. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, how asynchronous SAR ADC works, uh, you take an input sample and you add or subtract differential voltage during the conversion. So there's some probability that the input of the ADC comparator is so small it takes forever to resolve the uh, logic value of that. And that, that's a metastable, uh, metastable condition that would translate into symbol error. Um, now, one practical approach is to make sure that you don't run the ADC too fast so that you don't run into metastability to begin with. Uh, but that's not going to help, right? Because we want to run the ADC fast enough to, to reduce the number of interleaving. So basically, the strategy is to run it fast enough so that the uh, probability of error from metastability is below your thermal noise floor of the ADC. So um, this one is, is it's an, an example plot of error magnitude versus BER for different scenarios of a sampling rate. Okay? So we want to pick the right ADC sampling rate that does not um, incur high cost of, uh, of uh, metastability. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the TX design very, very briefly. Uh, only three slides on this one. Um, so, Typically in ADC-based link, uh, the TX only contains several tabs, like four to five. Uh, the reason is a peak power constraint, right? The TX can only transmit so much swing, and you have to split that swing for your main cursor and for other cursors. If you put more and more cursors on the TX, the portion of the TX swing that attributed to the main signal will be less and less, that hurts your SNR. That's one constraint. The other one is more like protocol-related constraint. If you rely heavily on TX FFE, uh, and then you Trying, to, you need to have a, a continuous back channel communication from your RX to TX. Um, the reason is the channel characteristic will change over voltage and temperature, right? So you need to keep up with the temperature drift. And if you rely heavily on TX FFE, you have to keep telling the TX to change the equalization when the channel characteristic changes. And some protocols are not uh, prepared; they don't have a um, mechanism ready for that, for, for continuous back channel. What uh, it allows us to do is actually one-time calibration of TXFFE, just optimize it once, and then the rest of the um, adaptation has to be done in the RX in case the channel characteristic changes uh, due to temperature drift. So the main uh, problem designing TX for PAM4 is, of course, what one is high swing, it requires high swing, and requires good linearity. Uh, typically, there are two implemented options on the TX. One is pure analog base, the other one is a deck based uh, TX. So, I'm just going to go through this briefly. The analog PAM4, uh, the serialized data. Uh, this is an example of, of a 4 tap FFE uh, transmitter. So, the serialized data is split into four streams uh, one bit stream for each uh, FFE tap. And then 
you sum all that taps in the analog domain. In this case, you sum it at the pad. That's why it's called analog TX, because you, uh, you create an equalized waveform in the analog domain. Um, uh, for more information, um, you can look at this paper. A lot of papers actually discuss the analog based uh, PAM4. Um, recently, with 7 nanometer process, people more uh, more and more stepping away from analog and they, they've been building tech based TX. In this case, the, there's a DSP or FIR block here that um, generates equalized waveform already. So the, at this point, the waveform is in digital domain, but it already represents the uh, equalized waveform. And then you serialize the equalized waveform and transmit it using a DAC. So the difference in analog and, and, and DAC base is where the equalization happens. Okay, um, at this point, um, there's almost half an hour, and um, maybe I'll should take a break, and there's a lot of material that I've discovered. If you have any question now, before I move on. Okay. Okay, if there's no question, I'll, I'll, I'll get a drink and move. Okay, so uh, the next topic is on the receiver side of the ADC-based uh, transceiver. This is the block diagram of ADC-based uh, receiver. The incoming input signal is terminated uh, using a T-coil-based uh, termination network. It is then fed to a series of uh, receiver equalization, linear EQ and a variable gain amplifier. Uh, the signal is fed to time interleaf ADC so this is where the analog signal is digitized into digital signals. And DSP takes that digital signal, perform further equalization, and uh, generates a decoded symbol. This is the uh, symbol that you want uh, in binary form. There's one, typically one big logic block that performs ADC calibration, equalizes and adaptation, and CDR logic. Uh, the input to this logic is the decoded or sliced uh, data and error and also raw ADC data to do ADC calibration. Um, the ADC calibration logic uh, calibrates the ADC, so that's uh, controlling the ADC clock sampling skew, and also uh, controlling ADC offset and gain. The EQ adaptation controls the analog uh, parameters for the CTLE, and also FFE and DFE coefficient. And the CDR controls the phase of the phase interpolator, so we can uh, sample the signal at an optimum sampling point. So I'll go uh, over each component uh, one by one. I will start with the receiver front end first. So the goal of the receiver front end is precondition the signal, so the ADC has, uh, and DSP doesn't have to carry all the all the load. Um, so typically, um, we have CTLE that has both high frequency boosting and mid frequency boosting. Uh, let's suppose you have a pulse response that looks like this uh, from the channel. Uh, high frequency boosting is shape your pulse response near the cursor. That's a near cursor equalization. And the mid frequency boosting will shape your pulse response uh, in the region of this long tail. Right? So typically, some people choose only do one and then leave the DSP to take care of the rest. Uh, but typ typ in typical design, we will see both HF and MF boosting. Now, in, in addition to performing this function, uh, typically we also have a variable gain amplifier at the receiver front end. Its job is to make sure that the output of that front end, which is the input of the ADC, is within ADC dynamic range. So you don't want it to, be, to exceed the, what ADC can do. The design matrix for receiver front end that includes the usual suspect, bandwidth, uh, peaking, linearity, and, and noise. Uh, one thing that's unique to ADC based transceiver, however, that the ADC tends to have a high number of interleaving. So the uh, input load presented by the ADC to the receiver front end is, is usually larger than the analog counterpart. There are several options to build CTLE. Uh, one is the classic uh, CML uh, RC degeneration based uh, equalizer. In this case, the, you would program the capacitive degeneration value here and the capacitive load together to control the amount of peaking you want and to make sure that the peaking happens at the right frequency. Uh, this design also allows constant DC gain. Uh, it's, some implementation prefer that, so the 
there's no last interaction between CTLE and VGA adaptation loop because they both impact uh, DC level. Now, recently, more and more people moved away from CML. Uh, like I think you already see the trend from this morning, right? People starting uh, to adopt a CMOS-based uh, uh, amplifier, so that uses both PMOS and NMOS. Uh, one approach is um, presented in this conference uh, last year. Uh, basically, you build amplifier component using only switchable inverter. Right? So a switchable inverter, this is the symbol. You can use this to build your GM cell. So that's input. So the output current is, is just a, a GM of the input. If you connect the input and output shorted together, you have a load, right? That's one over GM. And if you connect it this way with the help of resistor, you have an active inductor. So you have three basic components of amplifier that you can build simply using a switchable inverter. Um, so with this uh, basic component, you can build the entire CTLE. Um, so this is the main path. Uh, this is the high frequency boosting path, and that's the mid frequency boosting path. Um, uh, of course, we need uh, a switchable uh, programmable capacitor too to control uh, where you want the peak uh, of the MF and, and HF. So more information on this design, you can look at that reference. Um, in ISCC this year, there's yet another form of CTLE. This is a combination of still using CMOS, right? PMOS and NMOS are both used, but uh, degeneration is still done using uh, RC network. And the current, instead of being fed to active inductor, it's being fed to a TIA to convert the current into voltage. So that covers the uh, receiver front end. Um, now, how do we design the ADC? Uh, so this is an example of, of an ADC that is used to, uh, to, be, to implement a 56 gig PAM4 link. So this is a 28 giga sample per second, 32 way time interleave ADC. So the 30 way time interleave is split into two stages or two ranks. Uh, the first stage is a 4x interleave. So you have four phases of seven gigahertz sampling clock. So the aggregate sampling rate there is 28 giga symbol per second. Now each of this rank one sample is then resampled again, uh, 8x, using eight phases of 875 megahertz uh, sampling clock. Now each of this rank two sample is then fed to uh, ADC. So the ADC is actually only running at 875 megahertz, but there are 32 of them, right? Um, so that's where the analog to digital conversion happened. So the timing diagram for this circuit is shown next. So the top uh, side of the figure here that um, pictures the four phase of the seven gigahertz sampling clock. So one, two, three, four. Um, the two phases, the two opposite opposite phases here, phase zero and phase two, they are completely non-overlapping, so they can share the same input buffer as shown here. So this input buffer can serve phase zero and phase two because they're non-overlapping. So there's no interaction between these two. Okay. Um, now for the, the bottom part of the graph shows the eight phases of 875 megahertz sampling clock. This is the rank two clocks associated with just one of the phase. So this one is associated with the phase zero of the seven gigahertz clock. So you can see this sample here, right, and the track and hold. This, is, uh, this sample here is resampled by this phase of the 875 megahertz clock. This sample here is uh, resampled by that clock and so on and so forth. So that's how we achieve a 32-way time interleave ADC. Now on rank two, we allocate the time so that during when the sampling clock is high, you take the incoming data and then you hold it on the falling edge of this clock. And then the rest of the time is used for the ADC, we call it sub-ADC, right? uh, uh, to do the conversion from analog to, to digital. Okay. So this is shown in the next slide, actually, Maybe later, not now. Um, so when you design high-speed transceiver, uh, high-speed link, and the ADC, the sampling front end portion of the ADC, that's the track and hold and the buffers, that's the, uh, the, the most important component to get it right. right? The ADC, of course, we need to get it right, but the sampling front end uh, inherently limits the bandwidth of the ADC. So we need to pay a special attention here to make sure that the sampling front end, the buffer, and the sampling switches have sufficient bandwidth. 
if you don't have enough bandwidth on the sampling front end, two things can happen. Okay, if, if bandwidth is low, but they uniformly low across sub ADC, you can probably correct it. That's the, it's just an extra ISI. You can make it part of your channel and the FFE can correct for it. So that's not the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is your bandwidth is low and each sub ADC has its own bandwidth that are different from each other. So you cannot apply a single FFE filter to correct for it. You need to have FFE filter per sub ADC, which gets very, very expensive. So in practice, we just want to make sure that we don't have this problem, just make the, make the bandwidth sufficiently high. Okay. Um, the buffer is typically implemented using a source follower. You can use PMOS source follower or NMOS source follower uh, to reduce self-loading from the current sources. Uh, a Casco device is used. Um, if we were to adopt a CMOS base or inverter based CTLE, the common mode is in mid-rail, so you can actually use this instead of um, source follower, you can just use another CMOS uh, circuit as a track and hold buffer. Right? So this is a GM cell followed by active inductor load, and that what drives the uh, sampling switches. The track and hold switch itself is pretty straightforward. It's usually pass gate based uh, sampling switches. Um, so this is the complementary pass gate, clock and clock bar here, and clock and clock bar there. Um, now, if you just use this pass gate, when the pass gate is off, you still have a um, capacitive uh, coupling between the input and output, uh, uh, especially in FinFET process, uh, CDS is not negligible. So you think the pass gate is off, but AC-wise, uh, still, there's still a path from the input to the output. Uh, to overcome that, uh, we use this cross-couple feed-through cancellation. Basically, we insert it in off, an always off pass gate in a path so that the CGD, CDS coupling from there is cancelled by that path. Okay. It adds some load, but it's well worth the, the isolation. If the common mode is not um, you know, suitable for sampling switches, um, we would adopt another kind of track and hold switches. This is a bootstrap version of it. Let's say your common mode is closer to supply because you're using higher uh, supply in the front end. So you can't use CMOS there. So you would use a bootstrap circuit. I'm not going to go over how this thing works, so you can read the reference there. It's, it's been around for a while. Again, even with this bootstrap switch, um, we still need to have this feed-through cancellation. So the advantage of bootstrap is, of course, uh, it maintains constant BGS. So the on resistance of the switches can be kept small, regardless of the um, incoming input level. Now, uh, some words on, on uh, sampling front end sampling time. Uh, as you can see from this diagram here, uh, in this design, the rank one and rank two sampling pulses are overlapping. Right? So the same analog voltage is being sampled by both rank one and, and rank two. But uh, each one of them has different settling time requirement. For rank one, uh, the, because we are running rank one with, at seven gigahertz, the available time to do tracking is much shorter. For rank two, is, is, is higher, right? bigger. So the settling time for rank one is determined by uh, T rank one, it's the time available to do tracking. So the rank one output has to settle within half LSB within this time, time window. And rank two is more relaxed because rank two, the track time is longer. So you have more time to, to settle. So you can optimize the, you can reduce the bandwidth of rank to, to, to reduce power. Okay. Now how do we make sure that the sampling front end works and can be plugged into a system level model? We usually abstract the sampling front end uh, using a pulse response. Um, so you would send an ideal pulse response to the circuit and then you sweep the sampling clock phase to obtain this profile here. Now the pulse response of the ADC sampling front end is a function of two things. One is the tracking bandwidth that I just uh, talked about in the previous slide. So that's a, that includes the buffer bandwidth and, and the switch bandwidth, right? But that's only half of the equation. The other one is as important as your clock rise fall time. As you all know, the rise and fall time of the clock determine the sampling aperture. So you can actually shape the, uh, the pulse response of the sampling front end. And you would use this uh, pulse response to, to be plugged in into system level model. OK, 
Okay, now switching gear to the ADC itself. So this is the one of the 32 ADCs that we use, right? And it's operating at fairly low frequency, 871 megahertz. Um, and a differential toplet sampling is used for those of you familiar with, with uh, ADC. So what it allows us to do is uh, during the conversion, let me step back and see, uh, just um, uh, describe briefly how the sub ADC works, right? You sample a voltage, and then based on that voltage that you sample, the comparator make a logic decision whether that's a one or a zero, depending on the polarity. Now, depending on that output, you switch in some amount of voltage differentially to that same signal, uh, either a 16 LSB or minus 16 LSB, for example, and then you modify the level of that signal and you do the comparator again. It's kind of like a binary search uh, uh, algorithm. Now, if we use this kind of uh, architecture, the voltages that you add or subtract during conversion is purely differential. So there's no common mode change throughout conversion. That'll help the operating margin for this um, uh, comparator. The comparator sees constant common mode, and we usually we optimize that common mode, so the comparator is always operating at its best uh, operating point. So this is the timing budget for asynchronous R sub ADC. This one is actually the same diagram as, as this here, right, the rank two timing. So what it's saying is that we we have 32 UI total time to do sampling and conversion because this is 32-way 30, time interleaf system. So you would budget about three UI-ish to track the incoming data and then you hold it here and then the remaining 29 UI, uh, we would use it to, to do seven bit conversion. This is where you convert uh, analog to, to digital. Okay, um, if you zoom into one of this conversion, it'll look like this. So first, you have a, an, a voltage here at the input. The comparator makes decision whether it's a one or zero. Um, and then the time delay for this operation consists of two parts. One is the fixed comparator logic delay, right? And the other one is the regeneration time constant of the, of the comparator, because it has uh, positive feedback. So it, um, so there are two terms associated with the first half of the conversion. The next ones, after the logic is resolved, uh, the value is latched and sent back to the capacitive stack. This is where the uh, differential voltage was either subtracted or added to the, to the signal. Um, and then it also, at the same time, the C deck is settling. Um, we also reset the comparator. And the comparator is being reset to get ready for the next uh, comparison. So there are two scenarios here. One scenario is when the capacitive stack dominate timing, and the second scenario is when the reset dominate timing. So uh, for a good, uh, well-designed uh, ADC, we want to make sure these two are roughly equal with, with slightly more uh, time for, for reset than, than CDEC settling time. So at least you don't do comparison uh, until after CDEC is settling. The comparator used in ADC is standard uh, strong arm based comparator. The, um, there's an old reference here that, um, that describes exactly how it, how it works. Um, the key metrics here is uh, one, of course, is input referred noise. So the input referred noise of this comparator will be the dominant, if not the only dominant factor of the entire ADC design. So the ADC thermal noise is, is usually solely depending on, on the input referred noise of the comparator. Um, the fixed delay is important, so that determines how fast you can run the ADC. Uh, regeneration time also. And you also want to quantify the amount of kickback noise, uh, because if you have kickback from this comparator, it will make the CTEC settling time longer. And also, input referred noise is important, because the, all this offset, there are 32 of this, right? Uh, each one of them has uh, its own offset, so we have to correct that offset some, sometimes analog domain, most of the time it's in a digital domain. And if you do it in digital domain, it eats up your ADC dynamic range. So you want to minimize input referred offset of this comparator also. Uh, there's also a popular variant of this called the dual tail comparator. I'm just showing you the, the reference of that work, JSSC 07. Um, the last portion of the ADC that I want to cover now is the, is the clocking. So the input clock from the CDR, it's uh, fed into a uh, phase interpolator. 
Uh, the f there's only one phase interpolator, but the output of that phase interpolator is four phase, no, not one phase. And the four phase is usually the way you build it is one interpolator running at higher frequency, and then you divide it by two to, to, to generate four phases of clocks. Right? So these four phases of clocks are moving together. Okay, um, you apply skew correction just to make sure that the spacing of these clocks are pristine and optimum. Uh, Judy cycle, forty percent Judy cycle generation block is inserted there to make sure that clock zero and clock two are completely non-overlapping. So if you have fifty percent Judy cycle, they are just overlapping, right? And that may create an issue because both uh, zero and two are sharing the same input buffer. The same uh, 7 gigahertz uh, four-phase clock is uh, then sent to a bank of dividers. So the divider is what generates the eight phases of 875 megahertz clock. So in total, there are four groups of um, 875 megahertz eight-phase clock. So, so the sum total is 32. And the 32 clocks, they have every, each one of them has unique phase, right? That's what's um, uh, feeding the 32X SAR ADC. Uh, the skew correction circuit uh, that we put in here can be built using a programmable RC delay. So you have an inverter uh, driving a load, and we can adjust the RC of the load. Right? So we adjust the R um, of, uh, seen by, by this output. You can modulate the delay of this inverter. That's how you would do a, a cheap, uh, limited range uh, skew correction circuit. Uh, with this circuit, we're able to achieve 100 frames per second resolution uh, with plus minus 5 picosecond range. Okay, this is a summary of what needs to be done in the ADC, right? So we talk about how important sampling front-end is. The way to characterize it is to uh, extract pulse response, uh, preferably with different input amplitudes, so you can see both bandwidth issue and nonlinearity issue if, if they exist. Mm. Noise, you can simulate it, but it's usually pretty small compared to CTLE and, and SAR ADC noise. The SAR ADC slice, we need to simulate, make sure it has enough timing margin, and we need to simulate, make sure the metastability uh, error rate is, is acceptable. Uh, the noise is usually dominated by comparator noise, and the INL and DNL from the uh, capacitance stack mismatches needs to be quantified. At the top level, um, we need to take care of uh, sampling clock timing, make sure the clocks that are supposed to Non, to be non-overlapping, they're indeed non-overlapping, and make sure the pulse width are you know, uh, compliant to the to the specification and so on and so forth. And also, I talk about not using ENOP to specify ADC, but sometimes you want to sanity check your ADC anyway. Just just run it, run ENOP to make sure. Um, when you run ENOP simulation using sinusoidal input, you can see a lot of uh, ADC impairment also. Okay. So that's usually a sanity check done at the top level. Okay. Now uh, we switch gear to uh, ADC clocking. Oh, sorry, not ADC clocking, the receiver clocking. So at the top level of the receiver, uh, the job of a receiver clocking block is basically there's only one important job here to, uh, to do a phase interpolation. So there's a control word, a digital word from, from CDR logic they would adjust the phase of this phase interpolator so that the sampling phases are sampling the right uh, position of the eye. Um, now, one thing that's unique to PAM4 is it has very little timing margin inherently to PAM4 because you, t you try to send two symbols at a time, right? So there's some uh, transition that causes your eye to, to shrink, and you don't want to shrink that eye further by having a non-ideal non PI. So linearity of the phase interpolator is, is a lot more important in PAM4 compared, compared to NRZ, um, especially if you have cases where the input signal has a PPM offset uh, compared to the, your local oscillator. So the phase interpolator has to rotate continuously to catch up with that. And if you have nonlinear problem in the PI, it will hurt your, your timing margin. So for that reason, in this design, uh, instead of traditional quadrature phase interpolator, um, we apply eight phases of clocks. So with eight phases of clock, the INL, the PI, can be made a, a whole lot better. Um, the next slide, um, I'll go over how we generate eight phases of clock. 
to serve uh, phase interpolator. So this is uh, done using injection lock oscillator, uh, described in last year's ISSCC. So a ring-based oscillator has an eight-phase output, right? and the injected signal is only have a single phase. Now, to make sure that the eight phases at the output has a uniform spacing, we want to make sure that the ring oscillator natural frequency is as close as possible to the target frequency. So there's a control loop here that monitors uh, the phase uh, spacing at the output clock and make sure that the spacings are close to each other. If not, you would adjust the natural frequency of the ring oscillator such that they are all equal. Okay. Um, so the detail of this uh, can be uh, obtained here in this paper. Okay, um, I'm actually at a, an almost slide number 60, so I'm, again, I'm going to stop here and see if you guys have any questions before I move on. I'm going to save the question for last, I guess. Okay, okay um, so we talk about receiver front end, ADC, uh, receiver clocking. And the next big block is the DSP itself. So what's inside the DSP? Uh, DSP uh, performs three functions. One is the ADC offset and gain correction. Remember, we have 32 ADCs, right? Each one of them would have mismatches. So we need to take care of the offset and, and the gain. Um, it performs feed forward equalization. Basically, for uh, it basically performs this equation here. YK is... Uh, FFE equalized symbol, XK is the raw unequalized symbol, uh, and the equation is nothing but applying an FFR, FIR filter to the input to get the equalized output. It also performs one tap uh, speculative DFE. So in our system, we have, uh, I think in this one, is 15 FFE taps and one DFE tap. So this is the block diagram of DSP. The signal, this is a uh, digitized signal already from the ADC. Uh, it's uh, deserialized. This deserialization is completely optional. Um, the clock, uh, the data at, at this point is clocked at 875 megahertz, right? For some pleasant route flow, 875 may be too fast. So if that's too fast, we deserialize it and run everything at 64, uh, at 64 bit wide and the speed reduces from 875 to 437 and a half, so that uh, some PNR flow likes to, to operate at that low frequency. Uh, the first thing it does is offset and gain correction, and then the output goes to an FFE block, which uh, performs the FIR function. The output of the FFE blocks goes to a speculative data and error slicer. I'll have a block diagram of each one of these components later. Uh, so at this point, uh, there are four sets of data and four sets of errors because we're doing speculation on the DFE. And there's only one right side. We have to select one out of that four. And that's where the uh, DFE mux uh, comes to play. The DFE mux selects which version of the data is actually the correct one. Now, there's a heavy interaction within DSP and the remaining of the logic block, like ADC calibration, EQ adaptation, and CDR logic. Okay, um, the ADC gain and offset correction is a pretty simple block. So the output of the ADC um, is deserialized. So at this point, we have 64 symbols. Each symbol is seven bit wide. But these symbols have offset mismatches and gain mismatches. So um, the offset is nothing but an adder. So we add the appropriate amount of offset per symbol. And same thing with the gain. You apply an appropriate multiplication of, of gain per symbol. And we have the saturation logic. The saturation logic, its job is to make sure that when you add offset and you multiply by gain and the value exceed uh, a seven bit range, it does not wrap around. So the, a big positive number doesn't become negative number. Right? So we just cap it there. That's what, what, what this is for. So at this point, we will have a offset and gain corrected ADC data. Seven symbols, uh, sorry, 64 symbols, seven bit each. And this data is not equalized yet. It's partially equalized by the TXFFE and RX front end, but heavy equalization is still needed. 
Now to equalize it, there's a bank of FIR. So this is the stream of symbols. So this is symbol 0, symbol 1, symbol 2, and so on and so forth. Each symbol is 6-bit. And that's the FFE coefficient. Uh, in this case, there's uh, 16 taps from H minus 4. That's the fourth precursor all the way to H11, which is the 11th uh, postcursor. So each tap is multiplied by corresponding data. So that's multipliers, a bank of multiplier, and the result is uh, summed up to get one output symbol. So a sum of product, a 16 term sum of product, uh, gives you one output. So imagine there's 64 of these guys, right? Because we process the data 64 symbol at a time. So it's a giant matrix of sum of product, and that what consumes power in the DSP. So optimizing how this is performed in place and route, or even build it by hand, is an option if you really struggle with power. Um, but um, to, for, in practice, we will just use a place and route and make sure that the, the PNR tool is doing its job. Okay, so that at this point, the Y. Okay, this is the output symbols here are already equalized, properly equalized, except DFE. So let me take a step back. Uh, if you combine FFE and DFE, so this H1 here is the first post cursor, we zero it out in FFE. So we don't, because we want to have DFE to take care of that. So the H1 in this case is zero if you also using DFE. Okay. So why uh, zero and up to Y63 is partially equalized, except for one type DFE. Now, I want to spend some time discussing about the digital slicer. This is a PAM4 symbol, a cartoon diagram of a PAM4 symbol. And this is actually an analog voltage, but represented in, in digital uh, domain, right? So this, there's a digital value that represents this uh, waveform here. So we would place uh, three data thresholds dh, dz, dl. And above dz, the data is 1, 1. Between dh and dz, it's 1, 0. Between dz and dl, 0, 1. Below dl, is 0, 0. Okay. That's pretty straightforward, right? That's for PAM4. Now, we also have four sets of error slicers. The error slicer, the function is to help uh, equalization adaptation. I'll go over the algorithm later. And also CDR. Um, now, there are, four, there are four error slicers, but only one of them is used. So, for example, if the data is 1, 1, in this case, uh, only the value of uh, this slicer matters. We ignore everything else uh, because we know the data is above uh, DH. If the data is 1, 0, then only ELP slicer is used. So, at the output of this uh, slicer, we have uh, two bits of data and one bit of error. Now, remember, we're actually doing speculation, right? So there are actually four versions of the slicer that I just showed there, four instances of it. Um, because we're doing a speculative DFE, we have to make speculative decision uh, assuming four different scenarios. Scenario number one, if the uh, value of, of tap one is three, uh, sorry, the previous, uh, the previous bit is three. Uh, second scenario, if the previous bit is one, and Third scenario if the previous bit is minus one. Fourth scenario if the previous bit is minus three. Right. So we we have four scenarios. That's why we have four slicers. Okay. At the output here, you'll have four sets of value. Uh, so that's called D3, D2, D1, D0. We don't know which one is right yet because um, this is the, it's not resolved yet. And the, the job of the DFE marks is to resolve that. Uh, again, the 64 of these uh, structures, we are, we are processing the data, 64 symbols at a time. So the power consumption of this uh, speculative DAP slicer is, is the second major component of the uh, DSP. Now, the job of the DFE max is to resolve the DFE speculation. Right? So, for example, um, there are four versions of possible symbol ones, D1, 0, D1, 1, 2, and 3. Now, the mark selection comes to, from the previous symbol. Let's say we already make a decision. We know what the right value of D0 is. Now, the right value of D0 is used to select one of these four values of D1 and also the corresponding error. And so the right value of D1 is used to select um, 
the mux or so on, to, to determine the selection of D2. So it, it, you do this in, in Deshi chain uh, fashion, just like any uh, traditional uh, DFE, uh, speculative DFE. This is only done in parallel domain. That's why it looks a little different, but it's actually very similar. Now, of course, we need to decide the mux selection for D0 itself, right? And that is done using previous data. Remember, we do everything in parallel domain. So the last symbol of the previous parallel cycle, which is D63 of the last the previous uh, parallel cycle, is used to, to select a D0 mux. Okay. Now the critical path here, you have for every 64 UI, this is the, um, the clock frequency of DSP, um, we have to resolve uh, 64 times 4 to 1 mux selection plus 1 clock to Q. So this is the critical path equation and for 56 gig, this one can be met, but uh, for 100 gig, it, it, it'll be difficult. I'll, I'll, I'll go over that in my uh, one of my last slides. Okay. So that wraps up the DSP. So we talk about the offset and gain calibration function, FFE, DFE, everything that's in DSP. Now we also rely on um, logic block to perform ADC calibration, CDR, and equalization adaptation. Uh, ADC calibration, so we actually rely on the fact that the input data to the ADC is pseudo-random. Ideally, it's random, but there's no such thing, right? So if you assume a pseudo-random input data, uh, we can rely on the fact that long-term average of individual sub-ADC sample has to be zero. So you have random data, you have equal probability of one and zero. So if you take a long-term average of the sample, it has to be zero. So we rely on that fact to close the offset calibration loop. So that takes care of offset. How about gain? Uh, the gain, we rely on the fact that the long-term average of absolute values of each, uh, 30, each of the 32 sub-ADC samples should be equal. So if the gains are all good, right, and we take a long-term average of absolute values of each sub-ADC, they all should be equal. So that's the goal that, um, for this gain calibration loop. Well, timing skew is a little more complicated. Um, if you have a perfect skew and your data is pseudo-random and you take the slope between uh, sample 1 and sample 2 and compare it uh, compared to a slope between sample 2 and sample 3 and so on and so forth, if you take the absolute value of that slope, they all should all be equal if the data is random. So we use the, uh, the basically, I'm just describing this equation here. Um, so you, you would take the, uh, the delta voltage between each sample, take the absolute value, value of that, and drive the loop such that long-term average of those are equal. Okay. Um, CDR. So ADC-based transceiver typically uses uh, a baud rate a CDR. Uh, in this case, uh, Mueller-Muller algorithm is used. Uh, suppose you have a signal with this uh, kind of pulse response. Uh, this is a pre-FFE pulse response, right? You would have a peak in the pulse response, and you have a precursor, first precursor, and first postcursor. Uh, Miller-Miller algorithm works in such a way that the CDR locks when the value of the first precursor is equal to the value of the first uh, postcursor. If this value is less than that value, um, that's an, that indicates the sampling clock is early, so you have to move it to the right. If this value is not the same as that value that's, that's late, you have to uh, move back the sampling clock. So the good thing about Mueller-Muller is only requires uh, one sample per UI, and that's all we can afford, right? Because the uh, high-speed ADC is, is only taking one sample per, per symbol. Uh, there's some equation here on how to derive uh, timing update for Mueller Miller CDR. Um, I'm not going to go over it. Uh, there's a good uh, PhD thesis uh, out of University of Toronto, I think, that, that derived this. Um, one thing that I want to highlight, though, if you look at the, this final equation here, the timing update, uh, to do timing update, you only need to know the sign or the decoded version of the error. And you only need to know the decoded data. Okay. So 
basically all uh, those two values are available at the output of DSP. Right? You don't need to probe the internal values of, of the um, of the DSP to, to do the CDR. Um, now, if the input of the data is equiprobable and uncorrelated, you can see in a statistical sense, right? Like e k minus one times d k, it's actually the same as e k times d k plus one. So the current error, the previous error times the current data is, a, is statistically the same as the current error times the next data okay. uh, in a statistical sense. So we can actually conclude further that all we need to know to do uh, CDR uh, timing update is the, the current sign of the error, the previous data, and the next data. That's all you need. So, okay, and that, that's illustrated in this drawing here. So this is a cartoon drawing of a PAM4 signal. Let's assume the CDR um, at this point is locking, not locking yet, but the sampling position of the CDR is here, right? Here, if you look at the error slicer threshold, um, which is here, that's the median of the level, uh, the error is going to give you a minus one. Right? So this sample is below the error, so that's minus one. The previous data is minus three, because this maximum negative value, and the next data is plus 3. So if you remember the previous equation, if the error is minus 1, the previous data minus 3, the next data is 3, you do the math, the, the update decision is early. So that means this sampling clock has to go to the right. So there are many examples that are shown in the, in the references. So this is just to give you an illustration how MMCDR works. Um, how about FFE and DFE adaptation? The FFE is uh, basically uh, using a sine sine LMS. The goal is to minimize the square of error. Again, I'm not going to go over the derivation, but the highlight here is the FFE update depends on the fact that we need to know the sign of error and also the sign of the pre-FFE data. This is important. So this is actually XK. XK is before FFE, right? not, uh, not after FFE. So if you know the error and you know the sign of the error corresponding to that bit before FFE, you can close the sign sign LMS loop. Now the good news for ADC-based transceiver, this raw data, pre-equalized FFE data, uh, is actually readily available in digital domain. Right? So we already did the hard work of converting the signal from analog to digital. So getting the sign of a pre-equalized input is, 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 is trivial. Okay. Now if you choose to do a DFE adaptation, which we will do in uh, tab one, um, uh, you can use sign sign LMS uh, with the sign of error and the uh, sign of data, which is uh, after the decision. So this is, there's nothing new here. DFE adaptation is, is, is the same as before. Um, so that wrapped up the uh, digital loops, right? Uh, just to summarize um, the work here, the, the typical power consumption for ADC-based link um, uh, is shown here. Uh, so the first work here is, is, is done in 60 nanometer, so the total transceiver consumes 9.7 picojoule per bit. About 20% of the power is consumed in the transmitter, 40% uh, in the receiver and ADC, and about 40% in the DSP. Um, when like recently, there are more publication in 7 nanometer, and the power certainly has improved to the range of 4.5 to 7 picojoule per bit. But I would warn you to take this with a grain of salt. The power is a factor, almost a factor of 2 here. And this is not apple to apple comparison, right? This work has a, a lot more features compared to that work. For example, this is targeting a very harsh environment where you have to, uh, very um, um, difficult supply noise to deal with, so you have to regulate the clocks, regulate pretty much everything. So um, and th this work is actually pretty similar to that. So if you want to make some guess, maybe 30%, 30 to 35% power scaling is what we expect going from 16 to 7 uh, uh, with the same architecture. Okay. Uh, so those things that I just discussed, that apply to 56 gigabit per second uh, transceiver. So how do we scale this from 56 gig to 112? What's, what's difficult? Okay. We actually did the work already, and I'll share with you now what's, what's hard. Um, the first one, obvious thing that we need to do is probably just increase the number of time interleaving. Right? 
from 32 to 64 running at the same frequency, we double the throughput. Okay, that's, um, that is done in this work here. And the way we built 864-way time interleave is to upgrade the rank one sampling clock from four phase to eight phases. It's shown in this timing diagram. So instead of four in the previous drawing, it becomes eight now. And each one of this uh, rank one sample uh, is resampled eight times as was previously done, 56K. So all we need to upgrade is rank one. Now, it sounded easy, but it's not. Uh, to design link that works at 100 gig uh, instead of 56 gig, we still have to upgrade the sampling front and bandwidth by 2x, right? Because the circuit that works with 14 gigahertz Nyquist will not work 20 gigahertz Nyquist. So um, there are many circuit work there is done, um, mainly optimizing inductors and T-coil. And of course, we have to burn some more power to make sure that the sampling front and bandwidth is sufficient. Um, that is shown in this figure here. Uh, one thing that's probably interesting to note here, if you have eight-way uh, rank one time interleaving and you don't have sufficient bandwidth, you will see this little ISI tap eight here, because um, basically the previous sample was not was still there. The residual voltage from the previous sample, which is eight symbols ago, is, it, it's still showing up. Uh, so that's um, now that is hard. Now the receiver front end is even harder. Um, the reason is this, the time interleave ADC has to double from 32-way to 64-way. Right? So the output load of the receiver front end double, but the receiver front end itself has to have higher bandwidth, right? It's from 14 gigahertz Nyquist to 28 gigahertz Nyquist. So not only we need to hi have higher bandwidth, but we also need to uh, drive uh, 2x the load. So the job is actually 4x more difficult for the receiver front end uh, circuit designers. Um, the way we solve this again without Consuming too much power is you're optimizing inductor and T-coil, hoping that there's still something left there to extend the bandwidth. And this is where the EDA tool to, to inductor and T-coil synthesis and analysis becomes very, very important at this speed, because we rely a lot on that. If the modeling is inaccurate, we will get surprises in, in the silicon. Um, how about DSP? DSP is also also has to change. Um, this plot uh, shows you a transmitter and receiver and the major source of discontinuity, which is the C4 bomb, uh, package BGA, and the escape region of the PCP. Um, let's assume that your 56 gig design is able to cover the reflection uh, near your TX and RX. Let's say 11 tap FFE is enough, right? Now, when you go from 56 to 100 gig, the physical distance doesn't change. So it's the same as in millimeter, right? But in UI, double. So if you want to cover reflection here with 11 tap of FFE, you now need 22 tap of FFE. Um, so the range of FFE increases, and the throughput of DSP also increases. So again, the job of the DSP designer is actually four times harder, not, not two times. Um, so again, significant power is going to be consumed uh, if we don't do anything special here. Uh, and it's also more difficult to meet DFE timing. Uh, so the simple DFE marks that I showed here, uh, this one here, right, the critical path of 64 or 421 marks, this one will, longer, <coughs> will no longer work if you just blindly adopt this architecture. So instead of this uh, simple daisy chain base uh, DFE marks, uh, we would adopt a more sophisticated look-ahead scheme. Uh, there's a reference here, uh, work done by, by a folk at Cisco. Actually, it was IBM before, now he moved to Cisco. Okay, on the RS clocking, again, you want to keep the same steps per UI. That means you have to increase the resolution of the PI <coughs> from 7-bit to 8-bit. And we want to keep the same uh, uh, level of random jitter in CUI. That means you have to sharpen the clock edges too from 56 gig to 100 gig. Okay, that pretty much wrap up the 100 gig scaling discussion. From now on, I'm going to present the 112 gig uh, result. So the first thing we do when we, the silicon comes back to the lab and just to see how good our RX front end and ADC is. So to do that, we put a 28 gigahertz, or close to 28 gigahertz input signal, uh, capture the waveform, take an FFT, 
Uh, from that, you can deduce a lot of information like, uh, like random noise, random jitter, and all the spurs here are associated with residual offset, gain, and, and skew. And in this particular example, the major spur here is because the skew, the residual skew is still in the order of 250 to 300 femtoseconds, which looks big in, the, in this plot, but it actually does not degrade to PER that much. Um, so to measure the link performance, the transmitter is looped back to the receiver through this channel. That's an ISI-inducing uh, channel. That's a real FR4 backplane. Or not backplane, actually, just a board with, with, with trace. And we also inject uh, some amount of random noise to emulate crosstalk. So the, we intercepted the receive signal here and used the noise generator box uh, to inject a random noise in there to check our receiver performance. This is the insert and loss from TX to RX, from BGA to BGA. It does not include the package losses. That's about 33 dB. And this is new to ADC-based uh, transceiver, right? How do we know that the, um, the waveform looks good uh, in, in ADC-based transceiver? Because we can no longer do a 2D sweep uh, when the live data is present. Basically, we want a live traffic, live data. At the same time, we don't want to disturb that data, but we want to see how good of a waveform we receive. So with ADC base, the way to do it is um, every, every time period, we take an 8,000 symbol at a time, that, that 8,000 consecutive symbols, and we plot the uh, equalized uh, symbol over time. So that's why you see these four lines here. That, that, that represent the four levels of PAM4 data. And this dash line represents the uh, data threshold uh, digital slicer. So you can see that uh, there's enough separation there. That's, that means the symbol is uh, properly reconstructed. So we can do this with live data. Now, the, this is the I, receiver eye diagram that we used to in, in, in analog uh, transceiver. Right? We can no longer do that with ADC base, uh, especially if uh, want to make sure that the live data is, is pristine. So we actually, um, the way we generate this plot is we freeze the CDR, right? and then we apply the FFE and DFE there, and we uh, plot the symbol here. So one slice of this at one timestamp here is actually carries the same information as, as this. Okay. And then we have to sweep the CDR left and right to get a 2D plot. But when we sweep the CDR, of course, we actually operate uh, on the live data. So the BER of the live data will get impacted. Okay. So this um, 2D uh, eye diagram is generated uh, by uh, hurting the live data, uh, per se. Okay. Uh, but uh, for diagnostic or debug, this is very, very useful. Like, um, we, we don't care much about the, uh, the live data. We want to see how, how good of a receiver we have. Okay, um, this is the summary of the measurement result uh, for 33 dB loss, uh, that is the plot. So there are two curves here, one is uh, 27 dB loss, one is 33 dB loss. And with 33 dB channel, we are able to handle 1.5 millivolt RMS crosstalk with a BR better than 1E minus 6. Okay, um, that was my last slide, so I'll just like to summarize it. So um, the ADC base for transceiver have gain traction at 56 and 112. Uh, it uses hybrid analog and DSP equalization. The non-idealities need to be accurately captured and modeled. Uh, we described the design of 56 gig uh, RX front end, sampling front end, ADC clocking and DSP. Uh, digital loop schemes of ADC calibration, adaptation and CDR was also described. And the ADC base architecture can scale up to 112 gig, but more more work needed to, to reduce um, power from uh, the, because we need to extend the bandwidth and also scale the equalization capability. Okay, that wraps up my talk. Thank you. Yeah, so certainly with ADC base, you can see here, right, the, um, the latency through. Yeah. So my question is, how much of this uh, is playing into the latency? Okay. Of, you know, if you reduce the number of times of uh, FFP, it reduce the 
Okay. So the question is, um, with ADC base, uh, what is the impact of, of additional laten latency from DSP to the CDR bandwidth? Apparently, the, as you all know, the standard already reduces the bandwidth. They, they acknowledge the latency. So to answer your question, um, if we reduce the number of FAB taps, how many clock cycles can we save in terms of latency? The answer is not much. So we can, um, at 56 gig, we can do the entire FAB operation within, within a, a, a one clock cycle or two. So uh, saving one clock cycle will not give you, uh, will not double your to the tolerance corner frequency. But if it's done in a parallel You could, yes. But, you know, with, with 164 or 132. Uh, yeah. So, so you, you basically you're saving a 60, uh, 32 UI or 64 UI. Uh, and, and if you convert it to nanosecond, right, um, you can cut, do the math and then you convert it to degrees, assuming the corner frequency 4 megahertz, you probably end up like hurting yourself by like three, four degree. Uh, we need to do the calculation. But the, the phase margin degradation from there, just from saving one cycle is probably not enough. We do want to save many, many cycles though if we want to shoot for uh, higher CDR corner frequency. Yes. You mentioned the 9.7 gigahertz number was Yeah, so the question is what's the power for 112 gig? So the 56 gig design is 9.7 at 60, at, that's 60 nanometer. We expect the power to be around 7 uh, picojoule per bit in, in, um, in 7 nanometer. If we uh, scale it to uh, 7 nanometer and run it at 100 gig, we are targeting right now 7 and a half ish uh, picojoule per bit. So um, not there yet, but we are. That, that's uh, not just our target. That's actually the industry's target. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that. No, okay. You were mentioning that uh, depending on the data, you would only use one of the. Uh, that's right. I mean, but you haven't determined the data yet, right? You know, you want to yeah. Uh, no, at this point, um, this is not has nothing to do with speculation yet. So we already know the data is uh, the data. The data for this slicer, you already resolve it. It's either one 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 zero zero one or zero zero. You know this the data from this slicer, so you know the error uh, that you want to use from this slicer. Right? So basically, I'm only drawing this portion here. So at, in, at this level, you know exactly which error you want to pick. Yeah, yeah, so oh, so the question is how, how does this uh, timing square algorithm work? So imagine you have pseudo-random data, right? and then you have equally spaced sampling. Right? So a necessary condition is you take the slope for sample one, sample zero, and then it has to, a long-term average of that has to be the same as the slope from sample one to sample two, right? So you've taken... These are the level, time for level? Not time for level, this is the... Um, oh, yeah, when it locks, yes. It, it, it doesn't really matter if it's time for or not, right? If, if, the, if the data is random enough, and you take a long-term average of the delta V, and you compare the delta V from this previous two sample to the next two sample, to the next one again, uh, they has to match. So I actually have two questions regarding the power consumption. So one, the, the first question is, if you compare like seven, 16 nanometer to 7 nanometer, you said there's about 30% saving power consumption there. Yeah. Can yeah. you comment whether the saving is coming from the DSP side or from the ABC itself, or it's even up? Okay, so the, the question is uh, whether the power saving from 16 to 7 is from DSP or... Um, I would say the breakdown doesn't really change that much. So the DSP and ADC, that's... that's uh, uh, DSP is definitely a digital circuit, right? You take advantage of scaling there right away. Uh, and the ADC is also mostly digital. 
a comparator capacitance deck. So you take advantage of both capacitance and voltage scaling. So I would say most of the saving is from um, DSP and ADC, but then also the transmitter portion. It's mostly digital circuit also. There's a lot of inverters and clock buffers. So I'd say everything except the receiver front end and the PLL would take advantage of process scaling. So the question is, um, what's the power cost of going to, to ADC compared to analog? I think that you recently published analog uh, link in 16 was about five to six picojoule per bit. So we're still talking about 30 percent. But um, I, I'm not aware of analog transceiver that's supporting LR right now. They maxed out at like 20, 25 dB. Um, so, and then 7 nanometer, I'm not aware of any single design that's being published actually that's not ADC based. So, I think to answer your question is probably about 30% in 60 nanometer, and you, you probably want to target MR instead of LR with, with analog uh, transceiver. Oh, is there a difference between PMR and channel yeah. number? Um, uh, so the question is whether we can determine the channel loss from the pulse response, or I don't quite get. Uh -huh. Oh, if you want to try to calculate PMR based on channel loss, I don't think there's an easy way to do that, actually. Because PMR take, also takes into account reflection and long tail and really depends on the overall channel profile itself. So channel loss is kind of summarizing something. That, it's simplifying things, right? There are many ways to build 30 dB channel. The PMR number for the 56 gig design, I, I don't think I remember it, probably around two-ish. I'm not quite sure, but, but we're trying to target that kind of number. Um, so just a, another question on the transceiver side. Uh, you mentioned that there's a So the question is whether one tap DFE is worth it or just convert everything to FFE. Oh, we still see uh, a performance difference um, between, so we actually have programmable DSP, right? We, we could program it to do one tap DFE or just one tap FFE. Uh, the tap one to tap zero ratio, we, we could still see as high as 0.4 or even 0.5. So doing DFE does help. Whether it help, whether it matters at BR, one either minus six or not, um, it's, it's tough to answer. But if you're targeting ten to my, uh, one is minus ten, one is minus nine, yes, you, you, you will see the difference between having one type DFE versus not having DFE. We actually love to have DFE, of course, but uh, we, can, we can only do one, one type. Uh, can you comment on the reason why the JTOW corner was dropped from 10 megahertz to 4 megahertz? 
Yeah, so the, the question is, why did the standard relax the CDR corner requirement? It's... Could you give us a breakdown? Oh, I don't... The question is, can I, can, can I give you a breakdown of the answers? My short answer is no. But it's going to accumulate, accumulate the latency from ADC and uh, many, many cycles of, of DSP, and also the CDR itself. Okay, the CDR is, a, you, you need to perform uh, a CDR function, right? The, the logic delay through the CDR logic itself is not free. Uh, and we operate at parallel uh, domain here. So like every clock cycle is, is 64 UI in our case. So I'd say if you want to shorten the latency to push the CDR corner frequency, you pretty much have to find a way to run the DSP and CDR logic at, at higher frequency. Which we, we, it's not like we can't solve it. I think the standard already acknowledges it, so we don't have to solve it. Yeah. So it's, it's a, I think relaxing or um, changing the transmitter requirement is the right thing to do instead of uh, solving everything on the receive side. If you have a better PLL and better transmitter and you can afford uh, more relaxed uh, corner frequency of the JTAL, that, that's a right trade-off at, at the system level. Any other questions? I guess I have a follow-up question. Uh, so you Um, let me, so the question is, uh, the latency of analog versus digital, at the back of my mind is we could probably save uh, um, one to 200 UI worth of latency. It's definitely not enough to push the, um, the corner frequency from four to 10. Yeah. Even the analog one will, will require lower bandwidth also. Thank you.